Hi, David Bizard here, and you guys are watching Paratech 10. Just as a reminder, this is the channel that gives you the straight griff, no BS. And uh, we also kind of um, uncover some dirt when necessary. Now, that may be just what we're doing in this episode. Now, I have to say right up front that getting cold air from outside the car to inside the engine and keeping it cold or keeping the advantage of that potentially cooler air is not as easy as it may seem. All of those plastic cold air pickup systems you see are not doing the job as good as they could do. That plastic looks like it would be a good insulator, but it isn't. So a lot of the effect of picking up cold air is lost by the time it gets to either the carburetor, the fuel in, uh, or the intake manifold or the throttle body, whatever. I'm specifically going to deal with uh, EcoBoost Mustang because that's what I have to do my project on. So it's part of my EcoBoost Mustang deal here. But I can tell you that all of those cold air systems that are out there are not doing the job anything like as well as the system I'm going to show you how to build. But how can I claim these systems are bad without testing them? Well, they're all made of pretty much the same material. So let's look at how the materials manage to insulate the um, inside of the box from the heat on the outside. So we'll start with that first. Now here's the setup for doing this thermal testing. And I've put it on my grinding bench. The reason for that is the grinding bench draws air in like this. So although the hairdryer there has a sufficient sufficiently high stream of air to play on the back a matte black aluminum sheet the air doesn't come around the front it goes hits that spreads out and goes down so that's how we're going to do it now let me just set this up now with the black plate in place a simple test fixture piece of aluminum I'm going to apply the heat to one side and measure the temperature the other side first off it will be a bare aluminum finish but with black paint on it matte black to uh, replicate the absorbency of black plastic now what you see in these following frames are the uh, bases of our test subjects. Here first is the black plate. Heat plate on the back side. We checked the heat on the front side and saw how fast or not, as the case may be, it picks up heat with respect to time. Next, we put the gold reflective tape on. Then we put on the chrome finish uh, mylar. Then we tested a piece of wood then I think the next test was uh, case and so on. I'll put a list going by here and the results under. But there's so many numbers here that just looking at the numbers doesn't actually give you a clear picture of what's going on. So what we need to do is to look at graphs of what we see. First, the black plate column. That's the one arrowed and the columns in green. Here is the curve for it, the black dotted line. And just for the record, the further up the graph the line goes, the worse things get. What we want is a line at the bottom of the graph for the best results. The first test item on our list was the gold thermal barrier reflective tape. The uh, name of the company supplying this goes across the bottom. Now I have to admit this was a great disappointment we see all these gold foils on spacecraft where only maybe a thousandth thick 
uh, gold foil is insulating stuff against the raw output of the sun. But here, this stuff was very disappointing. Now let's have a look and see what it does on the graph. As you can see, its performance at the beginning of the curve was slightly worse. As things got hotter, it improved slightly. Now it could be that at higher temperatures it showed a better performance, but it wasn't really worth the money. Now, it could be the way I tested it, uh, uh, maybe it needed some air going over it, I don't know. I don't want to damn this tape just on one test. So anybody who's used it and done a scientific test with it, I would like to know. So put in the comments if you had any success with this tape. Next on our list of test items was the chrome film. Now, like the gold foil, this was very disappointing. This should have given us the highest reflective uh, results. However, I suspect that both in the cases of the chrome film and the gold uh, film, that the f heat frequencies we were looking at were too low in the spectrum for them to work well as reflective items. However, again, comments on that would be welcome. This wood was tested exactly the same way as all of our tests. That is, the heat on the back and the laser beam on the front to check the heat. Now I should emphasize that this structural balsa wood is much stiffer and about twice the density of regular balsa wood. This may have accounted for some of its exceptionally poor performance as a thermal barrier. But anyway, you can see from the results here, that is the top line, that it was a great heat conductor in the form we tested it. At this point, it's time to compare the case material with the subject material that's preceded this. So, let's have a look at what that is. As we can see, this is the blue dotted line on our graph. It is, other than the wood, the worst out of the group of test types we've done so far. So let's see what we can do to rectify that. For this next test, the gold reflective tape was added to the stock box. As you can see, it did actually help. Over the two minute test period, the amount of temperature that the inside of the case rose was 12 degrees less. Useful but not earth shattering. Moving on to the balsa wood over the case, we find quite a dramatic drop in temperature. 36 degrees in fact, so that's a good indication we're moving in the right direction. But instead of just using films and tapes, let's use something that's a real insulator. Insulating foam for household use. Let's try that out. As we can see, the temperature has dropped by a whopping 63 degrees. So we've really done our job far better than the original plastic case on its own. Now let's see what the implications are. Okay, it's pretty obvious that we've looked into this thermal management in, a, in an intense fashion. But what will it achieve? That's the point. Let's start off with one factor that is very important. The lower air temperature, so long as it's maintained right up to the point where it goes actually into the engine, i.e. all the cold air system and things like this. In our case with the Mustang, that's all through the airbox, down through the tube, and to the turbo. And with a non-turbo car, all the air system right up to the carburetor or fuel injection uh, barrels. Now, what's not really, um, uh, how should I say, appreciated very much is the fact that with a normally aspirated motor, every 
eight degrees that you drop the intake temperature arriving at the carburetor is equal to having one more octane of fuel octane. Now, I don't know how closely that applies to a turbo motor. I've never actually done the tests, but I have done a lot of tests with regular normally aspirated engine and I'm going to make a guess again based on my turbo experience that the figure for it is somewhere around 15 degrees for one octane. Now you can see that our um, tests have shown that our airbox is capable of supplying temperatures as much as 65 five degrees lower than would otherwise be the case. Which means that basically our 91 or 93 octane fuel acts as if it's 95 or 96 octane. Not bad. We know turbo motors have a tendency to blow up if they overheat and too much boost. There's a little safeguard there. But there's also the power advantage. That's another deal there. Now let's get back to the um, EcoBoost one here because that's what I'm focusing on. As I said in my previous video, the plastic tubing that goes from the airbox to the turbo is made of the material that the stock airboxes are made of and it conducts much more heat than you may think. And once again I have to say if you're serious about reducing temperature on your system the very first thing you should do is get that uh, thick wall, shiny uh, thermo rubber uh, air fixture from Euro I'll get the name in a minute I'll show you a picture of it again. Now, it might sound like I'm plugging it, but you know, our job here is to discredit the bad, maybe mention the mediocre, really plug the stuff that works the best on the market. And as far as I can tell, that air intake there is by far the best. On cruise, I think we got, on the test I did, we lowered the temperature by 47 degrees at the turbo. That's power and anti-detonation right there. Well, the octane increase is a good bonus, but let's talk about horsepower. Engines are very sensitive to temperature because the higher the temperature goes, the less dense the air gets. Now, the important thing is, is that it's not just the density that uh, offers us an advantage here. As air gets cooler, it tends to become less viscous. In other words, the flow capability of both the carburetor and the intake manifold, cylinder head, etc. gets better. So, what can we expect from the temperature drop? As it happens, for a turbo motor and a normally aspirated motor, the results of dropping air temperature are very similar. Now, I have to say that the tests I've done don't tend to jive too well with what's put out by SAE and things like this. Um, my experience, now let me backtrack a little while here. If you check out a lot of websites where the writer is talking about uh, correction figures and that, it turns out that for every 10 degrees drop, the engine will make approximately one point oh four percent more power in other words a nine and a half degree temperature drop will give you one percent more power i've never quite got to the stage of seeing those good numbers my dyno test to find out where i was at 
showed that it was near 12 degrees of temperature drop for every 1% of horsepower. When I say near, I'm talking about 11.9. So let's take 12 degree drop in temperature for a 1% increase in horsepower as a viable figure. Now, the horsepower gain comes about through a torque gain. Remember, at the end of the day, it's torque that rules on the racetrack. RPM next. Torque first, RPM next. So, if we can drop the temperature, and it's doable, by, say, 80 or 90 degrees on our normally aspirated engine, we are going to be looking at about a 7, 6 or 7% increase in uh, torque and horsepower, and... Uh, something in the region of 12 points or the equivalent of 12 points of octane. Now that's not going to make a car any faster in its own right just because the octane number has gone up. No, what it means is it moves the engine that much further away from detonation. Now one of the other things that we need to look at here which I don't think there's much done in SA stuff in relation to air temperature is the fuel temperature involved now a lot of these tests are done where they've taken the fuel temperature and disregarded any effect that it might have on fuel atomization or quality of mixture or apparently disregarded it and I think that's one of the reasons I see lower results is because if you drop the temperature of the uh, fuel then it's not going to atomize as well in the manifold so you have to make up for that somehow if you had perfect carburation before and at that temperature and then you suddenly drop the air temperature and fuel temperature then it doesn't necessarily burn as well so you've got to compensate for that so that could be which I have done in my tests so my numbers are slightly lower than everybody else's in terms of what you will get for your increase in horsepower as it happens turbo motors follow a very similar uh, route there does seem to be a difference between direct injection and non-direct in injection uh, engines in terms of how they react to reduced temperature. Right now I'm finding my Mustang responds very well to drops in temperature. In fact that's how I've got a lot of the power increase uh, from it just from uh, making moves in that direction. Anyway what I'm going to do here is wrap this up in terms of the technical stuff that's general and I'm going to look in episode 4 yeah it's going to go on at how to make my EcoBoost Mustang run much better by not only having colder air but also having a certain degree of ram effect from the forward facing scoop in the side of the radiator grill so tune in on the next episode which should be coming up in two, maybe three weeks uh, on this, and we'll see where we got to. So thank you for watching, and I will catch you later.